Hey there, this is Ms. Velasquez, and I would like to welcome you to week four. Today we're going to introduce what we are referring to as our democratic ideals. Reminder, last week we talked about introduction of what is government, which is a system to control and hopefully protect society. And then we took some time introducing the foundations of a government known as democracy. So democracy, remember, translates to roughly rule or power to the people. We looked at the historical roots of democracy, focusing our attention on two civilizations that contributed. One, we focused on ancient Greece, looking at the discovery or the implementation of direct democracy, okay, which all citizens have a role or participate in a limited sense. Remember, we talked about who was a citizen in ancient Athens. And we also talked about, again, the introduction of the Greek philosophers, which used things like logic and reason to try to better understand society. We introduced the concepts of the ancient Roman Republic, which is again building on the ideas. A Republican form of democracy is in which representatives or elected leaders uh, represent the people's wishes and try to get their voice heard. So looking at the historical roots, we before we move on with our discussion of democracy, I want to lay a basic foundation of what we call with our democratic ideals, or we call our democratic principles. So in a true democracy, when we start looking at the development of, and when we start looking at what we call our documents of democracy, there are certain basic assumptions or ideals that we hope to implement. All right, so today I'm going to introduce the basic ones. Please keep in mind that at this point, you should have your notebook, okay? Essential folks, I know even though it's an e-learning class, organization is essential. So if you have not found yourself a nice section of your notebook, title it e-history, e-learning world history, or again, your composition notebook, you want to make sure that you put today's date, as well as again, the title for today's lecture, which is Democratic Ideals. All right, so let's go ahead and get started with our Democratic Ideals. All right, the first of our democratic ideals and principles is something called the rule of law. Now you can see on the screen right now I've given you what it says, kind of it's literal word for word, and I also gave you a bullet underneath kind of just to paraphrase what it means. Okay, so the rule of law literally again means when the government shall be carried out according to established laws. Both those who govern and those who are governed will be bound by these laws. Okay. So breaking that down, the rule of law is kind of like a system of laws, it's institutions, it's, it's sort of a society and community commitment that kind of, you know, basically talks about what are the principles of following the law. So for example, concepts like everyone answers to the law, the government as well as the private sectors, private citizens, right, we're all accountable to the law just because you're in power or because you have money or you have some sort of strong family members, that doesn't mean that anybody is above or surpasses the law, okay? Part of the rule of law also means the laws are open, right? The laws are clear, they're publicized, they're stable, um, the laws are applied evenly, and ultimately we hope under the rule of law that they're designed to protect the basic fundamental rights, right? We'll talk about those, things like, um, Human rights, security, property, liberty, right? We hope that is foundational for our laws. We also hope under the rule of law that uh, the process which are in, laws are enacted, the way they're created, the way that they're developed, um, the way that they're administered and forced, they're accessible, right? That means everybody can be involved in that process, that they're fair, right? There, there's no um, special treatment in any aspect, and they're also efficient. Right? They're going to work, and they're going to work for society as a whole. Okay? Justice is usually delivered in a timely manner. Okay? So we'll talk about that justice and uh, the legal system. And so overall, again, we want to make sure that is a transparent system. So the rule of law is foundational for a democracy to be healthy and to function accordingly, is to kind of have that trust in that legal system and that structure. Okay, the second type of democratic ideal is something referred to as a limited government. All right, so what does limited government mean? What does it say, we should say? Government should not perform only the functions that people have given it power to perform. And that power is shared between the government and those who govern. 
So what does that mean? Okay, in a true healthy democracy, ideally, right, in a perfect situation, government cannot do too much. Power is usually shared with the government and its people. So this should sound pretty familiar, folks, because this is a foundation of our own democracy, right, is something called the U.S. Constitution, which puts in plan or incorporates the concept of limited government. Because you can see here on the screen, right, we have what is called the three branches of government, right? We talked about, or you talked about, hopefully in eighth grade history, this should be review. You have something called the judicial branch, okay, which is re representing making sure that laws are fairly interpreted. The legislative branch, which laws are created. Okay, and the executive branch, making sure that they're properly executed. Okay, if these don't look familiar, also just kind of keep in mind. So here's an example of the highest court of the land. Okay, which is known as the Supreme Court. Now we do have some new justices on this uh, image, needs to be updated. But ultimately, again, when we talk about the judicial branch, the judges on the system ultimately decide whether, again, something is fair, if a law can be enforced, and a law can be executed in our country. Okay, we also have, in this case, uh, President Trump. Okay, President Trump, and again, our new uh, Supreme Court Justice, Brett Kavanaugh, Okay. In this case, we see that uh, the Supreme Court works with the president. The president is part of the executive branch, right? They make sure that the laws are executed and fairly carried out. Okay, we also have the legislative branch. So for our legal system, right, the way our system is set up, we have two uh, groups or two houses, Congress. Okay, we have something called House of Rep Representatives, which is based on population of a state. And then we also have the Senate. The Senate is an equal distribution of representative, which includes two senators per state. So for example, in the state of California, we have two senators. We have again, Kamala Harris, and we also have Dianne Feinstein. Okay, those are our two female senators that represent the state of California. Now, of course, we also have representatives that are based on congressional districts. So we see that again, based on where you live, in congressional boundaries, you will vote for different representatives to speak your mind and voice your opinions in making our laws. All right, so let me go back a step. I have on the screen right now our third branch of government, which is the executive branch. So to understand in a limited form of government, in a true democracy, right, going back to that basic definition is the fact, actually, in fact, I'll, I'll put back the basic definition. Okay, the government cannot do too much, right? Power is shared with the government and the people. So for example, if something comes up, again, ripped from the headlines, right? Uh, for those of you who watch the news, which I encourage you to do so, again, I find that history seems to connect a little bit deeper when students see, again, the patterns and themes out in the, the news and the world. So let's say, for example, if there was a ten tension uh, situation in which the United States was possibly good to go to war with North Korea. Some people may believe that, again, the president has that power to do so, but that is incorrect. Really utilizing the form of limited government, okay, we know that the true power to declare war in a country actually resides with Congress, the legislative branch, and that Congress must issue an official declaration of war for a country to officially be, our country, I should say, officially at war. Okay, so reminder, the system of uh, sort of making sure one branch does not get too powerful was the system we refer to as checks and balances. Okay, so this is a system of limited government is one of the ideals we do use in the United States. Okay, our next democratic ideal is a legal system, legal process, I should say, which is something known as due process. Okay, so what exactly does it say? What is due process? According to due process, again, government must act fairly and accord with established rules in all that it does and may not act arbitrarily. Okay, so arbitrarily, and I put a little annotation, there's no reason or plan, and often unfairly, right? So it goes back to government must be fair, it must be um, just, and it must make sure that you're receiving your legal rights. So again, what does this mean? The legal requirement that the state or the country uh, must respect all legal rights that are owed to a person, okay? Now, we'll talk about this. The history of the due process actually goes all the way back in English history, back to the Magna Carta. And in that period, when we look at it, King John was doing um, things like uh, putting people in jail, taking away property, raising taxes, um, 
dealing with false accusations. Basically, he was deciding randomly if people were innocent or guilty based on whether they liked them or didn't like them. And when we start looking at the document known as the Magna Carta, the people wanted to be very clear that according to due process, right, we must know our legal rights and we must make sure that, again, those are protected. So in the United States, due process is outlined specifically in one of our documents that we'll look at, which is something known as the U.S. Bill of Rights. So, for example, both the Fifth and the Fourteenth Amendments of the Constitution. Okay, each of those amendments contain due process, which prohibits the government from taking any action that would deprive a person of life, liberty, or property. All right, let's go ahead and pause here real quick, and I just want to show a short video clip, a little cartoon that might help you better understand the concept of due process. Individual rights that are recognized as absolute when it comes to modern society. And yes, these rights unfortunately include tweeting that you had a Caesar salad for lunch. Freedom of speech, after all. But another fundamental right is the right to due process. You may be familiar with the term, since it's an integral part of American judicial philosophy, not to mention the Bill of Rights. In fact, it's the only command in the Constitution stated twice. But what does it mean exactly? Essentially, due process is the legal requirement that a government must respect all of a person's legal rights before taking from them, and I quote, life, liberty, or property. Specific elements of due process include the right to a notice of the charges against you, the opportunity to be heard, and the opportunity to defend yourself. When a system of law ignores any one of these steps before convicting someone, this constitutes a violation of due process and the rule of law. This is not a new idea, by the way. The very concept of due process was originally documented in the Magna Carta. No, the other one. Florida law, like most everywhere, includes, within the idea of due process, certain protections. For example, you can't be forced to testify against yourself. Due process also means no double jeopardy, which does not mean two doses of a TV trivia game show. It means being tried for the same offense twice. It must be remembered that due process only applies to the government, either state or federal and not necessarily to, say, a private school disciplining a student. The one thing the idea of due process lacks is specifics. It doesn't really outline which exact processes are due. The basic idea is that someone accused of something should have a chance to face her accusers and give her side of the story. So most everyone agrees that, at a minimum, due process must include notice of the accusation, a hearing of some type, and a ruling. The particulars are usually covered in each jurisdiction's code of law for different types of cases. Nonetheless, due process is supposed to apply to all citizens without exception. If you think you're being prevented due process, or just want to find out more about it, visit LegalU, because you have a right to know your rights.